Live from the Washington, D.C. area. It's the inside scoop. All the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Welcome to Inside Scoop Virginia. My name is Bettina Lawton and I'm your host. And hopefully all of our viewers realize that we have major elections coming up in November. And what we're going to be doing on this show is talking with a couple of our House of Delegate Democratic challengers. We're going to talk with an incumbent who, unusually enough, has an opponent this year. And then we're going to talk with the chair of the Fairfax Democrats about what the Democrats are actually doing. But we want everyone to have an opportunity to meet our challengers. And we are going to start with Marcus Simon. He is running in the 53rd House of Delegate District. Now, that is currently represented by Delegate Jim Scott. And he is retiring. And Marcus is running for that position. So Marcus, welcome to the show. Thank you, Bettina. Thanks for having me. Now, what's your background on this? Well, I am a, an attorney by trade. I have a small, a small business owner. I have a small real estate title company here in McLean. Uh, and I worked for Jim Scott, actually. I was his first legislative aide. Uh, that was my job, first job out of college. My first paying job was as Jim's first legislative aide uh, the year after he won by one vote. So mm -hmm. Jim, Jim won his first race by exactly one right. vote. Uh, and so my, I cut my teeth in politics being his constituent service provider. So I had to provide constituent service for the legislator who had just won by one vote, which meant every time the phone rang, everybody I talked to had to remind me at the end of the conversation, I need you to get this done and don't forget, I'm the guy, I'm the one vote, <laughs> one vote. That, that, that put your guy in office. So that put some pressure on. Uh, and I worked for uh, Kate Hanley for about five years after working for Jim in county government. So I've got a lot of experience in both the state and local government. Uh, I went to law school uh, at night while working for Kate. I have uh, about three years experience as an Army JAG officer, uh, so I did. I got right out of law school, and then I've been in the private practice of law for about 10 years now. All right, well, so that you have actually know what it is. You can find your way around the House of Delegates and down in Richmond, which is, which is useful. Now, I want to see if I can get the district up, because I did do a map. Well, I didn't do a map. I found the map right. of what your district was. So hopefully the folks in the control room are going to figure out how to put it up on the screen, but maybe not. Um, we'll see. Apparently not. But so let me ask you some other stuff. Um, you haven't held elective office, and there it is. You've got, you've got some Falls Church. You've got some Merrifield. It's kind of an odd-shaped district. So where are you in that district? Where do you actually live? So in that I context? actually, I actually live on sort of the edge of the district, uh, the northeastern side in, in West Hampton. So there are about two, there are two precincts in the Drainsville district um, of Fairfax County. Uh, I live in one of those two precincts, uh, sort of on the Falls Church McLean border. Okay. Uh, the the heart of the district is the city of Falls Church, uh, which is the sort of the lower right hand corner, the east side of mm -hmm. the district. Uh, so we've got the city of Falls Church. I like to describe it everything in Fairfax County that touches Falls Church, mm -hmm. uh, and then it comes out that 50 and 66 quarter out to, to Nutley Street and captures Merrifield there. Uh, head south a little bit to catch uh, Inova Fairfax Hospital, if you know where that is, sure. um, and those areas down, uh, almost down to 236 and back up again. Okay, so you've got some actually two very interesting, well, actually three interesting areas because you've got the City of Falls Church, then you've got Merrifield, which is really growing, and then you've got a lot of residential areas as well. So that's a challenging mixture. Um, so what made you get into the race? Was it just that Jim Scott was retiring? Is there some pressing need that you thought you could answer? Well, you know, that's a great question. I, when I heard that Jim was going to retire, you know, I immediately thought, began to think about getting into the race. It's something I've wanted to do for a long time. Um, I have two young kids. I have a 10-year-old daughter and a 7-year-old son who live here in Virginia. And they actually go to the same elementary school that I did. So I've uh, watched a lot of what's gone on in the General Assembly for the last three, four, five years. And as the Republican majority in the House has grown to now, I think they have 68 to 32 uh, in the House, a veto-proof majority, the legislation that they've started to put forward it seems to have grown more and more outrageous. Uh, so I've been frustrated with that and hearing about that. And my wife and I would sit up and complain about it. And I said, well, why complain about it? Why not get down there and start to do something about it? Mm -hmm. uh, I think I do have the background and experience to be able to be, even as a member of the minority, to be effective in sort of blunting the, the, the push to the right and uh, making the case uh, for a more progressive uh, agenda in Richmond. 
Well, in, in terms of being able to function in that sort of Republican environment, you were involved with the McLean Chamber. Chambers are and business owners and those kinds of things. Typically, people say, ah, must be a Republican. And to be a Democrat, I think it gives you some added credibility in that uh, group. I, yeah, I certainly hope so. Uh, you know, as a small business owner as well, I got a little tired of listening to Republicans say, you know, businesses want this and businesses want that. Small business owners can't stand for this. I'm like, nobody's asked me these questions. Right. You know, that's not, really not how I feel about it. Uh, and I think it'll be helpful to be able to stand up on the floor or in a committee and say, well, you know, my small business really actually would like to have more money spent on education. We really would like to see more money for our roads because I have employees that drive to work every day in McLean from Manassas, from Sterling, from South Riding in Loudoun County. And they show up at work and sometimes they've been in, in traffic for an hour and a half or two hours for what should be a 30 minute ride. Mm -hmm. And I gotta tell them now that you're here a little bit late, I need you to get on the phones and start providing great customer service for all of our clients. Right. So forget all that frustration, forget how upset you are, forget that you were in traffic for no apparent reason um, and smile when you talk to people. So you know, there's a cost uh, to everyone, to business owners like me, but also to my customers uh, because you know what? It costs me money to, to, I have to encourage these people to do that every day. Yeah. Uh, they don't do it for free, and so I have to pay them more, and that all gets passed on. So you, the other side seems to be focused primarily on taxes, but there are a lot of hidden costs and a hidden tax to not having an effective transportation network. Well, and you worked on that current transportation bill for the chamber, I thought. Right. So I did. The Chamber of Commerce you know, took a position. Um, initially, we stayed out of it. We, we weren't thrilled with the initial bill, that the, the plan that the governor put forward. And so we sort of stepped back to see what was going to happen. Uh, but the compromise that eventually emerged um, was something that the chamber felt we needed to get behind. Uh, and so we did encourage uh, the bill to be passed. It wasn't perfect, you know, like a lot of legislation that requires bipartisan support. Um, and was put together, cobbled together. There were pieces that we, I would prefer you know, weren't in there. Uh, the, you know, the, the hybrid fee, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, I think that you know, increasing the sales tax is a little regressive. I would have preferred to see, uh, you know, maybe just raise the, the fuel tax itself, the consumption part of it a little bit you know, higher, make that a more direct connection between the users of, and, and the fees. Uh, but ultimately, we had to do something. It was gonna create a lot of new revenue you have a Republican administration that's willing to vote yes for new revenue, this happens you know, about once a generation. So if you've got the opportunity to say yes to that, you need to find a way to yes, because you know, the area desperately needs the money and it needs the improvements. Our constituents in the 53rd, you know, we get up and down 66 all the time. We really saw the need, and I think that it's, it's good that we've got something you know, as imperfect as it might be. Well, and people have to remember that the money was actually running out. This wasn't the kind of thing where we were going to be able to limp along in two years' time. I think it was like 2015, 2017, something like that. The fund was done. Right. So, and we've seen what happens. I mean, you know, in Michigan, parts of Michigan where they literally had to, you know, not um, repave, but just trench the roads and turn them back into dirt roads because they didn't have money to maintain them anymore. <laughs> so you're going backwards from paved right. roads back to dirt roads. We can't can't let anything like that happen here in Virginia. Right. Exactly right. Well, you also have talked about the first bill you're going to introduce has to do with stalkers or something. What is that about? So I, you know, I do have a first bill. Uh, Jim Scott um, has come to me and he said, you know, he hasn't asked me to do a whole lot. He's been very sort of hands off. He wants me to be able to run my own race. But the one thing he's asked me to do, he had a bill uh, that he put in last year uh, that would make it a crime for someone convicted of stalking or domestic violence to possess a firearm or other dangerous weapon for five years after committing this offense. Wait a second, Wait, let me just pause here. So if you are stalking someone, if you're convicted of stalking or you're com committed domestic violence, you can get a gun in Virginia? It's still not illegal for you to have a gun in Virginia. Uh, and this isn't a, a strictly a gun control bill. I mean, keep in mind, this applies to any dangerous weapon, and there's a definition in the code for what constitutes a dangerous weapon. Mm -hmm. But you know, primarily, we're talking about firearms. And it, you, you can be convicted of stalking or abusing a family member that results in serious bodily injury, uh, and, and you still may not have your right to, to carry a firearm, a concealed weapon, uh, taken away. So this would say that you cannot, this bill would say that it's a crime, it's a felony, a class six felony, to possess a firearm for five years after being convicted of a crime like this. Uh, the Commonwealth's attorneys from all over the state have been behind this. Actually, there's a Commonwealth's attorney from Lynchburg uh, who worked really closely with Jim on this legislation. Unfortunately, it died. It was a short session last year. It didn't make it, it was laid on the table, didn't make it out of committee in time to cross over. Mm -hmm. uh, but the folks on the committee did say that they thought it could use some further study, that there were some questions that could be answered. So Jim was looking forward to bringing the bill back, um, except that he was retiring. So he's asked me to bring that back. So that'll be my day one bill. We will 
uh, get together this fall with the stakeholders, make sure we've worked out and answered all the questions, and it'll be the first bill that I introduce when I'm elected to the House of Delegates. Okay, so what are your day two priorities? <laughs> your day one is that bill. What are your day twos? So I want to work on a number of issues that I'm familiar with. And so one of the things that I've, as a real estate attorney, I'm very familiar with fair housing issues um, and issues that affect real estate itself, but particularly fair housing. I'd like to see another bill that Jim introduced frequently and never with much success, would have expanded the number of protected classes in Virginia's fair housing statute. Mm -hmm. So that we would pr extend fair housing protection not only to, um, to minorities and national origin, uh, gender and those types of categories, but also include a category for uh, sexual orientation. Um, so that, that would be another protected class. People couldn't say, you know, no gays allowed uh, when advertising a rental property or a house for sale. Uh, so I would like to see that added. I was, uh, one of the things I've done in my recent past is I've been a chairman of the Northern Virginia Association of Realtors Forms Committee. One of the things I'm proud of as in that capacity is I added in our list of protected classes in our standard forms, uh, sexual orientation. So we've done that by incorporating the code of ethics. So I'd like to see that happen statewide and that kind of a standard be out there. Uh, so that would be one of the things I'd like to work on as well. Okay, and then what about, um in Virginia, I mean, that's a very high, hard road to take, given that we've got a constitutional amendment banning um, civil unions, not even just marriages, civil unions. So are you interested in taking on that uh, issue as well? And there's the issue about the ability for uh, gay folks to adopt children and all of that? Yeah, you know, it, it's going to be a, I think the first step is going to have to be sort of turning the tide. I mean, right now the momentum seems to be going just the opposite of, of marriage equality and equality for people regardless of sexual orientation. You, right now we have a constitutional amendment. The first step is going to be to repeal that constitutional amendment, and that's not an easy task. But we've got to start somewhere. And so I, yeah, I think we need to start moving things in that direction, at least blunt the momentum. Uh, you know, when Virginia introduces you know, legislation to make it explicitly okay to discriminate against homosexuals in adoption, uh, to discriminate against homosexual students in organizing student activities on campus, I mean, not just to, to not make it illegal, but to ex explicitly say that is okay, you know, we need to, to start to step back from that. And if that would be the first step, yeah, I'd be happy to try and help make that case. And one of the other questions, and we've only got about 30 seconds left, but let's talk jobs for just a second. What do you plan for to get more jobs to Virginia? Well, you know, I, I think the best way to attract jobs and employers, as, a, as an employer myself, I, I think the best way is to two things. One, improve our transportation infrastructure, and two, great school at, at every level, uh, pre-K, uh, K through 12, and higher education. Because I think employers, if we're going to attract new employers and new industries to the region, uh, we're going to do that by showing them we've got kids they want to send their kids to schools, schools they want to send their kids to, uh, and we've got a great higher education system for great work. Well, I want to say thank you very much for coming on the show tonight. Marcus Simon, he is a candidate for the House of Delegates in the 53rd. Thanks. Around the world, one out of every three women will be beaten or otherwise abused in their lifetime, often by a family member or loved one. A future free from violence. It's all she's ever wished for. Did you know you have the power to stop children from joining gangs? You can help a father find a job and home for his family. You can assist a woman who can't afford the medicine she needs to live and the home she can't live without. You can choose to make a difference in our community. Support Volunteers of America and you can help improve the lives of nearly two million Americans each year with programs and services that help individuals and families overcome their challenges to become as independent as possible. Support the programs that are working in our community. Contact Volunteers of America today. Call 1-800-899-0089. For some folks, saving for the future is easy, but for you, it might take a little more effort. Saving for your future is your responsibility, and there's a lot to save for. I never thought of that. Like your child's education, perhaps uncovered medical expenses, 
or just to be sure you can live the way you want when you retire. The time is now to save for tomorrow. Save now or work forever. The choice is yours. Choose to save. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back. I'm Bettina Lawton. I'm your host of Inside Scoop Virginia. And we are doing a show about House of Delegate challengers. We've got a big election this fall. We want to encourage everybody to get out and vote in November. And we've got with us now Ed Deitch, who is running against Dave Albo. Dave Albo is an incumbent. He's been there for some time. And Dave Albo is sort of notorious. I'm going to try and play this video because, well, let me just say, I'm going to let you look at it. Let me see if you can look at it. We'll see. Oh, first, I got to do my sound. Let me make sure I got the sound up. There we go. I don't know if, if, if the people are hearing it or not. Let me see. Is it playing? No. Well, then we're going to have to skip the video. But I want to, if this is, and the title of it, as people can see on it, on the screen is Dave Albo's wife rejects sex with him. Yes. And for those people who have forgotten uh, how that worked, what happened was that Dave Albo said that he came home from uh, the General Assembly and he was Correct. all ready to have a romantic evening with his wife. And the news show was on talking about transvaginal ultrasounds, a phrase that he apparently is perfectly willing to vote for but is unable to say. He, he has a hard time getting it out of his mouth. It really was very odd. And, and I must tell you, Ed, I was wholly apart from the fact that he and I don't see eye to eye on virtually anything, the fact that he would stand up on the House floor, the, the House of Delegate floor, and subject his wife to that kind of commentary, saying, here I was, I had my red wine, I had my sexy music on, I'm all ready to, you know, mm -hmm. with the wife, and she turns me down. I was like, what kind of person does that? That's, that's really awful, which is why I wanted to play it to remind people that's what happened. But let me first turn to you instead. Absolutely. What's your background, Ed? I spent over 30 years running commercial print and copy centers. I ran two of my own small businesses, so I have a good feel for how to get a business to run properly, what help you do need or don't need from government. I also spent six years as a veterinary technician. Now what I do in my spare time when I'm not campaigning, I'm part of the Humane Society's National Disaster Animal Response Team. Now, what is that? Every time there's a tornado, a hurricane, in fact, I was in Joplin right after the major tornado there. I was on the Jersey Shore two days after Sandy. But it also deals with dog fighting, hoarding, all this kind of happiness. The first thing you learn doing that is how important it is to have private sector and government work together for a common goal. Mm -hmm. Without that cooperation, we would not be able to accomplish anything when we go out into the field on these things. Wow, so if there's like, you just go, there's an emergency, there's some We have to be disaster. invited in. Oh, really? Yes. We will reach out to the local government. We reached out to the people in Moore, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. shortly after the tornado hit there. Their comment was, we have it handled with our local people. If they needed the extra help, Humane Society would then mobilize our crews, which consists of search and rescue teams mm -hmm. and people who set up and maintain emergency shelters. So if the search and rescue team finds an animal, they bring it to the shelter that we set up. We then care for this animal, feed it water, give it some playtime, make sure it's walked and is safe until the owners can come back and reclaim their pet. And this is something that I think really got highlighted with Katrina. That's the first time I ever heard of this. That's kind when of it problem. started. Is it? Oh, okay. The laws changed with Katrina. Before that, people were told, do not bring your animal. Now, since Katrina, there has to be one animal shell, one shelter that will take in animals along with the people for every three that are just for people. Oh, I had no idea they did that. Yeah. That so was good changed idea, right after Katrina. That was a mess. Well, it wasn't just a mess for the 
animals, the people who stayed behind, those are the ones where most of the deaths came from because they were not going to leave their pet. Mm -hmm. Plus, it makes it harder for the emergency responders trying to get the people out because they don't want to leave without their animal. Right. And if they finally convince them to leave, then our search and rescue teams have to go into the same area they were trying to pull the people out of right. to get the animals. Well, so. it's, that was always something that was shocking, and, and I always sort of watched it. So that is great, great work. Uh, now your district, we've got your district on, and it's very odd because you seem to be going Springfield all the way to the river. I mean, that's with this huge cutout right in the middle. I, I don't know what that's all about. Well, that's the huge cutout, diverse. yeah, the huge cutout came right after they did the redistricting. That huge cutout, every little sliver of white that you see sticking in and out of that district is heavily Democratic areas. Ah, okay. Well, that makes some sense, I suppose, given that the Republicans controlled the redistricting. Right. So what made you decide that you wanted to run against Dave Albo? Other folks have tried. What makes you think you can do this? Well, because of my background, I've always been the kind of person who steps forward when there's something that needs to be done. I've never been one to sit back and say, somebody needs to get up and do something about this. And the video you're referring to, my wife and I were watching on the national news. And as soon as the clip ended, she looked me straight in the eyes and said, so when are you announcing that you're running? <laughs> she just knew I was not going to sit back and have that representing us in the House of Delegates. Yeah, yeah it was pretty shocking. Um, so what are the major issues in your area, in the 42nd? What we're hearing on the doors and what we're hearing, we've been doing some pocket polling also. And people feel that the major things to deal with, jobs, getting businesses to start wanting to come back to Virginia, mm -hmm. educational funding, and getting the people in the House of Delegates and in the Senate away from the ideological nonsense that's been going on the last couple of years and concentrating on getting us back to business. Okay. So they want the social agenda stopped. They want funding coming back to the schools. And they want jobs created in the state. Believe it or not, transportation we have found is down to about number five or six on the list, which surprised us. That is kind of surprising. Is again, that we're in the middle of one of the heaviest traffic areas, but right. to them, it, I guess they've just gotten used to it. They're numb. But what they want to see is school funding come up. I mean, if you look at the statistics right now, we're, depending on who you ask, the, anywhere from the fifth to the eighth richest state in the country. And we pay our teachers on average of 30th in the country, which is ridiculous. We want to make sure our, you know, our educational people get funded. Right now, the average age of the teachers in Fairfax County is approaching 50. Mm. When they retire, who's going to come into that pipeline? If we're not paying them as much or a little bit more than the other jurisdictions, they're going to be looking elsewhere for these jobs. Right. Our schools are ranked fourth, fifth best in the country. That's a tribute to the teachers. Their determination to get this done and to take care of these students, despite the fact that they haven't seen a raise since 2008, mm -hmm. that's just a tribute to them and their hard work. And are, do people respond to that on the doors, or do they look and say, great idea, Ed, but I don't want my taxes going up? No, actually, they think it's very important. We have found that the district has changed a lot. It's an older district as far as the housing, but the demographics have changed. There's a lot of young families moving in. They're moving in with children. They want to make sure these kids are getting a good education. They want to make sure that those kids stay in the area. And the only way to do that is, again, they have to get the right education so that they want to stay and bring their children up in the area. Mm -hmm. It's a close-knit thing. You know, it's the traditional thing in the state of Virginia is to keep the family nearby. Right. As far as jobs are concerned, I know from when I was running businesses, one of the first things you want to worry about is, A, how my people getting to work? Mm -hmm. Part of that was handled with the transportation bill. Is it the best bill in the world? Not really, but it got us money to move forward now. Now, the next couple of sessions, it could be tweaked, turned a little bit. Maybe we get a better bill out of it. That depends on the cooperation in the House. But as I said, the first thing you concentrate on is, how do my people get to work? The second thing is, what's their quality of life? Mm -hmm. If I'm going to move a business to Virginia, What's going to be like for my people? If the schools are starting to slide a little bit, that's not a good thing. If health care is not coming up to where it should be, where all around us people are accepting Medicaid expansions, things like this, not a good thing. So to get these businesses to come in, it's more than just giving them a tax break. You have to make sure the whole package is there. And Right now, that's not being worked on in Richmond. 
So you've got an opponent. Is he one of the ones who are against the Medicaid expansion? You mentioned the health care issues. I, I've been briefed by a couple of current members of both the House and the Senate. And the comments on Mr. Albo as far as health care was, if I give you the vote on transportation, I cannot vote on Medicaid expansion. I will not do it. Because I can't give you both. Which is just a political calculus, then. Just a political it's not a calculus. Based. Nope, it's political calculus. Okay. Um, what do you do about getting more jobs into the area? Again, we have to reach out in cooperation with the private sector and reach to other areas. I know we have different groups that reach actually outside the country. There's a group right now that's in Richmond that reaches out to businesses in Israel, for instance. Mm -hmm. They do a scan, they see who are the top businesses, they bring in the top five or six, bring them down to Richmond, show them what Virginia's like, show them the different areas, and they try to get them to commit to opening a business here. That's how the Sabra Hummus plant ended up in Virginia. Okay. They reached out to them in Israel, brought them over here. And this is what we have to do in other areas. We have to reach out to these large businesses and show them Virginia is the place where they want to operate. Well, do you think that the part of the difficulty of getting businesses to locate into Virginia tends to be both our transportation network, which makes that all difficult, mm -hmm. but we don't seem to be a very welcoming place. We, in the last several years, we've had the amendment against the gay and lesbian relationships. Exactly. We've had the governor not doing the executive off uh, order, saying you can't mm -hmm. discriminate. We had, of course, the current attorney general basically telling universities, go ahead and discriminate against right. um, gay and lesbian folks. Do you think that has any impact on businesses, or do they just sort of brush that aside? It has a tremendous impact on businesses. Again, you want the people who work for you to feel welcome. You want them to feel that this is home if you're going to move a company someplace or start giving out jobs to people. Mm -hmm. That's how you get your loyalty as far as your employees. They're loyal to you if you have them treated like family. If you're in an area where the ideological ideas coming out of Richmond are, we don't like gays, we don't want you here if... You're a woman. You're a woman. <laughs> We're going to pay you less if that. We don't want to take care of marriage equality. These are all things that are going to drive companies away. They are not going to come into that kind of environment. So are those the types of issues that you will sort of join forces with other Democrats? Or? I will absolutely be happy to spearhead those issues. Okay. Um, what do you need to do to win? What we've been finding is we're trying to set up precinct ops, kind of like the Obama model. Mm -hmm. We have 17 precincts in our district. We're looking for people in every single one of them that know the district, know the neighbors, know who they can go to. We've broken down the numbers so that we can go and say, hey, Bettina, in your district, we need 20 votes. Okay. And we're going to ask you to go out and find them for us. All and right. we're going to be knocking on about 15,000 doors to do it. So. Wow. Well, good luck with that. This is Ed Deitch. He's running against Dave Albo in the 42nd. Thanks for coming, Ed. I Thank appreciate you, Bettina. it. Thank you for inviting me. the smoke before you give it a try only you don't play with matches don't play with fire fire cause there's nothing very funny about three thousand like nothing very nice but a homeless mind so if a gorgeous force is what you desire don't play with matches don't play with fire yeah. only you can prevent wildfires fire why don't you just wash your car at home I wash my car, everything runs down the street and down into the storm drains. With all the chemicals and the soaps and waxes, the last thing I want to do is poison my own drinking water. At least here, it's all contained and recycled on site. That's why I also take my car in for oil changes instead of doing it myself. I might take a chance on spilling stuff. You know what the best part is? What? More time to kick back and watch the game. How far would you go to protect the planet? I want you to build an ark. Maybe there's another way. People, the flood is imminent! Is it too much to ask for a little precipitation? Go to fightglobalwarming.com to find out what you and your community can do to reduce global warming pollution.
Somewhere around the world, there are men and women of the armed forces risking their lives, helping rebuild communities after natural disasters, collecting toys for needy children, tutoring kids in school. These are your sons and daughters who work to keep us safe, secure, and free. Dedicated men and women who put their country first. Welcome back. I'm Bettina Lawton, the host of Inside Scoop Virginia. And tonight we are doing a number of delegate candidates. Now you've just seen a couple of the challengers, but tonight we've also got an incumbent, Mark Keem, who you I'm sure have seen before on this show. And this year he's actually has a challenger. The last time I don't think anybody ran against Mark, but this time they are. And so we want to bring Mark on to talk about um, what he's doing and going forward. So Mark, welcome back. I appreciate you coming in. Thank you very much. So you got an opponent this year. What were your accomplishments? You've been now in the General sure. Assembly for what, four years? Yes. Something like that. So what have you done that people should look and say, man, I got to reelect that guy? Oh, well, thank you. And thanks for this opportunity to uh, have a chance to talk to you and to others. In 2009, when I ran for office, I ran on three main themes. One is the most important thing that we need to do in the General Assembly is to make sure that uh, our transportation and the traffic congestion that we have in Northern Virginia is addressed in some way. Oh, they're looking to see if Mark's mic is working because something's not happening here. So we're hoping that he gets him going. And is it testing? Let's yeah. see. But we're now talking transportation um, as one of his major initiatives. So we'll keep on going. And hopefully sure. the people in the control room will get it fixed for you. Sure. Uh, well, uh, so as I was saying, the transportation it has been the, the major concern of all of ours. And uh, in my area, where we have Tyson's area, Vienna, Oakton, 66, the Dulles Toll Road, and the Hot Lanes, that's certainly a, a ground zero for transportation mess in Northern Virginia. One of the things I tried to do was, uh, I know for 27 years in the General Assembly, we've tried to address this for so long. What I tried to do is say, look, this is very important to Northern Virginia. I'm sure other parts of the Commonwealth also have transportation problems. So what can we do as a grand bargain? What can we do to bring everyone together, Republicans and Democrats, Northern Virginia, Hampton Roads, the regional areas, and see if there's a way that we can strike a bargain? And uh, this year, I think that we were able to deliver on that. What we did was put together a package that has a Northern Virginia specific and a Hampton Road specific uh, a package of funding for our roads. But more importantly, the statewide, we have a component that addresses that. And the part that I'm most proud of is that we, this was one of those few moments where bipartisan Republicans and Democrats all got together and struck a bargain. Now, nobody, not everybody likes everything in it, mm -hmm. but we're able to do that. And my role in that was I was one of the first uh, Democrats to step up on the House Finance Committee. And and took a vote which uh, a lot of people thought was possibly a mistake but in hindsight turned out to be the key vote that got the ball rolling and that was something I did ver that I was very proud of mainly because when I ran for office I didn't say I'm only going to do things if uh, my own party supports me or I'm only going to do things if it's only about this I said I'm going to be open-minded to everything and I think I'm going to do what is in the best interest so that's the kind of uh, leadership I've shown in the General Assembly Another area that I feel very proud of uh, is accomplishments is in the world of education. Uh, I'm a product of public schools, and I know that many of our, our generation and uh, our future generations will not be successful if it wasn't for the great schools that we have in Virginia. And the only way that we have maintained a strong set of uh, public schools in Virginia is because we made the investments, we decided what's the most important things to make sure the teachers are uh, performing well, at the same time to keep the costs low so that uh, throughout the, the Commonwealth and throughout the Northern Virginia, we're not gonna have schools that are just being run in uh, inefficient ways. So through the, the budget committee processes as well as the House Education Committee that I serve on, I had a chance to really take a look at what are we doing for education now and to make those reforms that are necessary. So one thing I'm very proud of is that we were able to deliver for the first time in a long time a 2% pay increase for the teachers, but that didn't, that didn't come for free. Uh, the condition was the teachers had to show that they're performing higher and that their, their expectations as a teacher is met before they can receive this kind of a compensation. So I thought once again that was a bipartisan grand bargain that we struck. And the third area that I'm most proud of is the fact that uh, even though I never served in the military, I know you, Bettina, your son, and many others uh, in our area have served in the military, uh, I think about how this country would not be what it is today if it wasn't for the freedoms that are guaranteed to us because of the men and women who fought for us in the military. And so I've tried every way possible to look for ways that I can help them. And one of the bills I passed a couple of years ago was to provide uh, equivalent training and certification so that those who are qualified men and women who've served in the military, who have skills when they come back home, 
home, they don't have to take redundant tests, they don't have to pay for schooling, they don't have to go, go through credentialing just to get the same job that they're already qualified. In fact, sometimes, for example, if you're an emergency me medical technician, you're doing things on the battlefield, saving people's lives in ways that some of the men and women here have never had that experience. And yet, when they come back here, Virginia says, you have to go through all these trainings and then we'll let you drive an ambulance. I thought that was wrong. So we fixed it so that now those men and women who come back from Iraq, Afghanistan, wherever else, they can have equivalent training and they can start working right here in Virginia, saving our lives right here. So uh, those are some ways that I think I've made a difference in the four years I've served so far. Well, I do want to really thank you on that, particularly that last point, because Virginia has an enormous number of veterans. And when my son came back, and he was, a, as you know, a combat medic, mm -hmm. and I was surprised to find out that it didn't count for anything in the civilian world. And I, I was kind of like, seriously? Because, you know, you, you get people blowing up, people who have written him letters, commanders who had written him letters saying you've saved these people's lives, but mm -hmm. yet uh, Virginia and I guess a lot of other states, they don't really appreciate the value and the knowledge that the veterans can bring. So for Virginia, not mm -hmm. just for Fairfax County, although we've got a huge number of veterans here, mm -hmm. uh, across the Commonwealth, that is a major, major accomplishment yeah. for our service members. Well, well thank you. And, and that, that brings me to a point I think is somewhat lost. A lot of times when we run for office, when we get involved in campaigns and we see Democrats and Republicans and we talk about all these divisive issues, something that we forget about is the fact that we're talking about the government here. These are folks who work for the government on behalf of a public interest. They're not in it for a profit-making motive. They're in it so that they can do what, what they think is a public calling. So if men and women who uh, wear the uniform and, and serve, whether domestically as uh, firefighters and police officers and other uh, sheriffs and others who are out there every single day for public safety, or those that put on a uniform to go overseas and fight for our freedoms, they are doing the government's job on behalf of all of us as a public interest matter. And so it's only right that the government provides them with all the resources that they can so to be successful successful when they uh, you know, take that uniform off. And I think the thing that's frustrating for me in politics is that a lot of times we talk about these things as if it doesn't really impact real people's lives. Well, who you choose to be your state delegate has a direct impact on your life because that person, he or she, will go to Richmond and write these laws that will help benefit these people's uh, services. And so I think as we think about electing people, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, whoever you choose to do so, Think about that person and what he or she will be doing for you and for all those areas where there is no voice. And one thing I've tried my best in my General Assembly service is to be the voice for somebody that doesn't have that voice. And so looking at issues like, I mean, it's not the most politically popular issue, but for example, when somebody comes out of the uh, prison, once he or she is done with serving their time and they're coming back into society, do we have the tools? Do we have the opportunity so that they can come back and become uh, regular productive citizens? And if not, they're gonna fall to the right life of crime again. So I've spent a lot of time, uh, again, across the aisle, working to see if there's a way that we can provide re-entry services and training so that those folks who come out of the, the, uh, the um, uh, prison system will find themselves back on the feet. So a lot of things that I focus on might not grab headlines, but I think in my own ways, I'm trying to make sure that our government works well, most efficiently and most accountable, and most importantly, that we as, as uh, citizens understand what's happening so that we can see the value of what your taxpayers' uh, funding is paying for every single day. Well, so you've got some obviously concrete accomplishments over the last um, four years or so. Going forward, mm -hmm. what do you want to do in the next two years if you get reelected? Well, we'll continue to do uh, the main focus of, of this area is transportation and on education. And those two jobs, uh, I will make sure that we are following up on the bill that we pass. And on education, the place I'm spending more time nowadays is beyond the K through 12, looking at the higher education, mm -hmm. and not just the, the flagship schools of this, of this Commonwealth, but we have some incredibly great uh, community colleges, and we have a lot of schools that are emerging to be really top-notch universities. What do they need to make sure that they have enough spots for our, our young children and, and men and women who are graduating from high school who can go straight into college. And frankly, we need to understand that some of our uh, students are not going to go to college. It might not be the right fit. For those that want to go into a trade uh, education or become uh, skilled in something else, are there opportunities at either at the community college level or in other trade schools so that we can provide uh, job opportunities and training opportunities for them? And even for those uh, folks who might have been uh, in one or two professions who decide later on in their careers to switch careers, do we have opportunities for lifelong learning and workforce development so that they are uh, productive uh, members of our, our, our community? So I'm looking at a lot of workforce development issues, and those are things that the government has a unique role to play. And being on the Education Committee, I, I'm looking forward to working with uh, the new governor and our, our new team to make sure that we're focusing on jobs as it relates to education and, uh, and lifelong learning. Uh, the other area that I'm very uh, interested in focusing on, if I'm able to come back to the General Assembly, is uh, taking a step back and thinking about our environment and our climate and, and all the issues that are around that. 
clearly we can have conf you know, conversations about is there in fact climate change or not, and I certainly think there is, and I mean, how much does a man uh, cause in that? But more importantly, what are we doing in Virginia to make sure that all of our lives are, are improved by stronger uh, you know, laws that would protect the, the safe water and the air and the open spaces that we're well renowned for in Virginia? And of course, uh, I'm very against the idea of uh, mining for new uh, uranium and, and creating that hazard there. So these are the, the t types of challenges that are, are going to be coming down in the next two, three years. And I'd like to be part of those conversations to make sure that not only are we keeping our health of our children, health of our women, health of all of our citizens uh, in, in the top shape possible, but also the health of the Commonwealth and our environment as well. Well, let me ask you in the, the couple minutes that we have left, what are you going to be doing? Are you doing anything differently from the when you campaigned when you had no opponent than you'll be doing this time? I mean, you, I see you everywhere, so I'm not <laughs> quite sure how much else you could do. But what's the plans? Well, you know, there, there's the old saying about if it ain't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, in my case, I learned campaigning through the grassroots process. I think campaigning comes down to talking to people. It's about me as a candidate running for office asking a voter who has that right to vote for me or against me to convince him or her that I'm the right candidate for this job. And that doesn't happen. I mean, no matter how many uh, glossy flyers and wonderful pictures of myself I can send to them, that's not going to motivate somebody to vote for me. I have to talk to them and ask them for that vote. And so I spend a lot of time talking to voters every single day. I'm out in the community. I'm knocking on doors. I'm making phone calls. I'm going to continue to do that. But this year, as, as you know, uh, we have a governor's race. And so I'm not the only name on the ballot. I'll, I'll be on the ballot with uh, three other gentlemen as a, as a Democratic ballot. And I am very, very proud to support every single one of them. Terry McAuliffe and the two other gentlemen who will be joining him on the, on the ballot. I don't think you'll see a whole lot of sunlight between all of our views, our policies, our positions, and our vision for our future. So we are excited to work as a team to go out there and campaign. And my friends on the other side of the aisle have made a tremendous mistake this year in selecting some extreme conservative uh, uh, folks who just are outside the mainstream of what we think uh, Northern Virginia needs. And so I'm looking forward to making sure every voter understands that there's a clear contrast between the two parties and that our party provides the, the meaningful solutions and the vision for where we want Virginia to go. And so in that context, I'll be out knocking on doors as I have over the last uh, four years and doing everything I can to make sure our ticket wins this year. Well, I think that's going to be the issue because this is, we've got that big 40-year curse or whatever it is, particularly in the governor's race, that when we elect a governor from one party, we usually, or a president from one party, we usually end up with the governor of a different party, um, which would mean since we have a Democratic president mm -hmm. uh, at the top of the Democratic tickets, really got a job to do to sort of break that jinx. Yeah, well, I'm a, I'm a big uh, reader of history, and I, and I love learning about history. But one thing I've learned about history is that there's no science behind it. <laughs> it's all it is <laughs> is true. all this is just a bunch of things that have happened. And if you want the future to change and future history to change, you have to act now so that the future will be based on what we do today. Election has not happened yet. It's November 5th, and in order for that election to come out the way I would like and for my friends uh, on our side of our aisle to like, we need to work that much harder to make sure that the history doesn't have anything to do with that. So let's make sure that uh, we create our own history this year and not rely on history of the past. Excellent. Well, I appreciate you coming, Mark, and talking with us. And hopefully, as you know, I uh, hope that you get reelected and you. that the entire team flips with you. Thanks. Thank you. Saving for retirement might be easy for some folks, but for others, it might take a little more work. And for those who haven't started, there are still things you can do to catch up. Oh, that is good news. Like getting out from underneath past debt. And don't get wrapped up with high-interest credit cards. Let's get you some eyes. Be diversified with your investments. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Your financial goals are not out of reach. The choice is clear. For a happy ending, choose to save. Everyone with alcohol and drug addiction is in the same boat. With treatment, you can find solid ground. For drug and alcohol information and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Are you sure you want this tattoo? Because just do it. Some mistakes in life are permanent. Like hearing loss. To learn how to protect your hearing, visit asha.org. You've probably
commonly heard about heart disease, but did you know that it's the number one killer of women nationwide? Heart disease claims more lives each year than breast cancer, lung cancer, or strokes combined, but there are steps you can take to protect yourself against it. For more information on how you can prevent heart disease, contact your local American Heart Association or visit their website at www.americanheart.org. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back. I'm Bettina Lawton. I'm the host of Inside Scoop Virginia. And we now have Cesar Del Aguila. He is the chair of the Fairfax County Democratic Committee. And I want to welcome you Thank to you. the show. Thank you. Absolutely. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, I keep seeing this phrase. Yes. And the phrase is, as go Fairfax, so goes Virginia. Yeah, I, I, I said that a long time ago. Well, okay, so. I'm quoting you then. This okay, is even yeah. better. Okay. Uh, because. It's good words. Uh, good words. Uh -huh. So is that really true, though? Absolutely. I think so. I think um, if you look at how many votes there are in Northern Virginia, Fairfax particularly, compared to the rest of the Commonwealth, that's where the density is. That's where we'll get a lot of votes. If we can, as, as Democrats, energize enough folks in the northern part of the Commonwealth, we absolutely will uh, will go blue, deep blue, this election. So what's the plan to assure victory? I, I keep what's hearing that you're sort of a multi-language kind of guy. You I am. To do that kind I of am. reaching well, out. What yeah, are you doing on that? Absolutely. So a couple things. So uh, to that point, uh, the Obama campaign taught us over two election cycles, in 08 and in 12, they put together a coalition. Mm -hmm. And they did outreach to these different uh, groups of people. Not just the minorities, but you know whether it was Latinos, whether it was you know the the Koreans or or you know southern uh, subcontinent Indian folks. I mean, it just everyone was touched. Mm -hmm. And I think what we learned from that in '09 was people do not come out right. unless you reengage them. So what I've done is I've I focused the committee on um, basically replicating that model through precinct house parties, precinct team leaders, that whole OFA structure, the Obama for America campaign structure, is basically what we need to replicate and energize to get the people out. Now, particularly at the county level, we're doing um, literature mm -hmm. and public service announcements in different languages as well. We'll start there and uh, keep that going because I think it's that level of outreach informing people not only that there is an election, because a lot of people don't know there's an election. That's amazing, yeah. With all the, I guess we'll get more and more TV commercials and stuff, because what I keep hearing is, like, for example, the Koch brothers are big into Ken Cuccinelli, so there's yeah. going to be tons of money coming in, yeah. which presumably will translate into a lot of television. But yeah, it but is awfully low turnout. Absolutely. It's, it's painfully low. It's painfully low. So what you have is a small group of individuals that are very passionate, that are very active, year over year in Virginia, deciding basically the elected officials for the larger group. And it's not true representation. So our challenge is to basically to get those folks out and get them engaged and informed, quite frankly, first. So. Well, do you think, because I know a lot of Democrats when the Republican convention was over a couple of weekends ago, and they came out with this ticket, including this um, Bishop E.W. Jackson, who had run in a primary, a Senate mm -hmm. primary, and came in like last with four or five percent of the mm -hmm. votes. And all of a sudden, he's their lieutenant governor candidate. And I, I, a number of Democrats were like, oh, this is great. This is a gift. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't believe that. Okay. I don't believe, here's the, the reason that concerns me a little bit is, again, when you have a small group of people deciding on those candidates. And if you talk to moderate Republicans, mm -hmm they probably would have chosen for a open primary right. as opposed to that selection process. Because you only had, I, I don't know the exact number, I think it's about a thousand people decide that for the entire state party. Mm -hmm. That's a little strange for me. So we're a little bit different. We have open primary statewide, but the best people win. Right. And I think from that you get more uh, people that represent the actual views of those segments and groups. So I don't, I don't look at that as a gift. You saw we had uh, two candidates prior to, and a delegate elected, Markeem. We have some sharp people. We're going to have sharp people uh, up and down, from Terry on down to the delegates uh, in all the Fairfax seats. 
I am really pumped up. I am proud of everyone that's running. I think we can do it. We've got a target of the number of votes that we have to get out in Fairfax County. If we Democrats do that um, in some percentages relative to history um, in 01 and uh, also in 05, let's skip 09. Let's not talk about 09. <laughs> and in 13, I think we're, we're going to have a good turnout um, based on the performance. So I'm, I'm stoked. I mean, you saw the, the candidates here earlier. I, I feel really good about them. So how do, you know, you've got the sort of neighborhood team leader. Can we really keep the folks focused on what we need to do going forward? Because people get tired, and we hear this, particularly sure. in the year after a presidential election. Sure. Sure. People are like they've gone all out to get Barack Obama elected in Virginia again mm -hmm. um, last year. And a lot of folks are kind of like, oh, you know, I know there's an election every year, but... Right. Um, well, I can't engage. I, I'm just, I can't do this. I, I can appreciate that. And it's not for everyone. That's what I've tried to do with the committee, the Fairfax County Democratic Committee, is a little bit different. I'm posi positioning us to be the structural platform year after year. Campaigns come in and they go. The campaigns are active for a few months mm -hmm. and then they're gone. So all the, the field organizers, the campaign managers, the finance people, they're active for a few months, then they're gone. In Virginia, what we can leverage are the people that are here that want to be active year over year, election over election, special elections, town elections. I mean, you name it, we have it in Virginia. If we help those people, giving them the resources year over year, I think we have a, a more sustained model and a more consistent model for uh, elections in the out years. So I'm not looking at just November. Mm -hmm. I want the committee, Fairfax County, to be focused on the two to five, perhaps the 10 year infrastructures, infrastructure as, a, as the campaign can leverage. Well, I think that would be an interesting change because as you said- I'm about change. You're, about, you're all about, about change. change. <laughs> That's what you're all about. I tell people there's a new sheriff in town, which by the way, we have, <laughs> we have a, uh, an election for sheriff too, so, but uh, definitely. That's exactly right. We've got uh, the sheriff is uh, apparently resigning, so we get to, to put in a new sheriff. Uh, yeah, I'll this. have to change that new sheriff in town thing. I used to claim that. You used to claim that. Yeah, you're not going to be able to claim that anymore. That anymore. No, no. Not without uh, getting arrested. Probably. That's right. <laughs> I'll be good friends with the sheriff. Unless you're making an announcement tonight that you actually are stepping into that race. Absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. All right. Absolutely just not. Well, I yeah. didn't want to assume that you were nope. 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 stepping aside. Stepping nope. aside. Uh, so how do you reach out? One of the one of the groups that I think always falls off in the odd year after the presidential are the young people. Yes. We have, we actually have a we have precinct now, don't we have these like university precincts or some such thing over at George Mason? We do. How do we engage young people? Because it seems they're a group where you just, they go off a cliff after the presidential. Well, again, I think there's, um, there's a couple things. The absentee mm -hmm. uh, chase program that we're initiating and we're gonna be funding hopefully here soon. Uh, that's one thing, get them to sign up while they're here. I want those votes in Fairfax, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> they can make a difference here for us. Um, so I wanna grab all those votes here. Um, and basically, we do have some people identified that are gonna be liaisons in those precincts and keeping those people informed, keeping the students informed, uh, registering them and giving them the information they need. I want all those votes coming into Fairfax County as opposed to them going back to Maryland or wherever they're from and casting votes <laughs> or not casting votes. And those places are, that don't have elections this year, so well, yeah. this and, is the time to do it. And I tell you know, my friends in, in D.C. and Maryland, make a difference here in Virginia. I mean, your state or district is pretty blue. Mm -hmm. You can really make an impact here in Virginia. And it's right across the river. Uh, and that's what we had, too, with the, uh, the Obama campaign. We had a lot of people coming in from D.C. and uh, Maryland and Pennsylvania in some places. So. Right. Huge influx, which we should be able to get again this year since the only other campaign so. is like New Jersey, New Jersey or yeah. something. So everybody no, sort of south of New Jersey needs to just come and help us out. That's my message. And Terry will tell them the same thing. <laughs> come to Virginia. And uh, if you can't tell, we all, you know, we see Terry, we get all jazzed up and fired up because I think Terry's got the, uh, the right solution. I mean, it's about jobs and getting Virginia back on track to be a business-friendly environment. You know, let's forget about these crazy issues that some people want to keep 
fighting over and over. Let's, let's make Virginia a good place for business. Well, and I think part of the making it a good place for business is dealing with some of the issues. I know Terry got a lot of credit, actually from Governor McDonald, which right. is kind of amazing, yep. on the uh, bipartisan transportation bill. That's but right. as I understand it, and tell me if I'm wrong, Terry actually was meeting with the Democratic caucuses down there to say mm -hmm. this is important. Yeah. Yes, it's a Republican thing, but we need to work this. Sure, sure. I, I think I did it a little bit differently as well. There are times when we, as a community, we need to make investments. We need to make investments, not because we're going to see a return this quarter or this year, but it's a good thing for maybe the 10 years or our children or our grandchildren. Um, that's what it's about. I mean, we don't live isolated, churning our own butter. Okay, mm -hmm. we live in a community. Okay, <laughs> we we have to collectively um, pull together sometimes, and it is a long-term uh, investment. I think that's what what Terry was looking at. Well, and I do. I like the sort of notion because people think of them as some kind of a hyper-partisan and the work mm -hmm. that he did on that bill yeah. really says, you know, listen, if yeah. it's the commonwealth that's at stake Absolutely. here, yeah. because contrary to some people's beliefs, the man actually has lived in Virginia for over 20 years. So. 20 years. He's created jobs. He's, he's been creating jobs since I think he was 13. Right. Uh, I mean, the guy's a working working man. <laughs> right. When I heard that thing about starting a, a driveway paving company and they're going to help pay for college, I thought, yeah, that's a job no one wants to do. <laughs> you know, in the, in the summer it's 100 degrees out and you're schlepping that black stuff on people's driveways. He saw a way to make a buck. That's Terry, right? So, <laughs> that's, that is Terry. That is so, Terry. Hey, so. when you're poor, that's what you do. Right. right? You kind of figure it out, get stuff done. So. It gets stuff done. So you think he can do it? Uh, absolutely. You think he can do this? Absolutely. Uh, here's why. Because not only is he a good person, mm -hmm. he's a bright businessman, and he's got the right approach on the problems that we're facing. And I think when people listen to him, I've been in meetings where it's been a hodgepodge, different people, Republicans, independents, strong Democrats. When they're done, when he's done talking to those groups of people at these business functions, they're sold on him because he understands what it's going to take to basically make Virginia sort of that, that crown jewel for businesses to come and invest. And um, you know, this other stuff that's going on out there that other people want to talk about, I just think those are all distractions, quite frankly. So I've seen that a, a lot of Republicans are coming out and endorsing Terry. Do you think that's something that's going to continue? I think there were four or five in the yeah, last I mean, uh, again, to, to kind of hit home the point, I've been in meetings with business leaders. When they're done with that meeting, they're on board with Terry. He's not this, I, mean, I don't know what they're, the Republicans are trying to paint him as, but he is not that person, mm -hmm. right? He's about jobs. He's about you know, investing in, in, in the things that the Commonwealth and the families want to see and hear about. All right, well, we'll hope that he gets his message through. Oh, he's going to. We're going to deliver Fairfax big time for Terry and our Democrats. Because as goes Fairfax, so goes Virginia. You can That's quote our me. Motto. <laughs> you can and quote we will me. quote you. So I do want to thank you for coming in. Absolutely, Cesar my pleasure. And and giving us your perspective. Sure, we gotta will... do a shout out to Cindy Brownie out there. So hey guys. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the friend and the dog, for those who don't know Cindy and Brownie. And, uh, and we'll have you back on before the election. Thank you so Thank much. You so Thank you. Pleasure. <laughs>